I'm Matt Hill. Today we're going to talk about how to create panoramic single row images that are a blend of images taken at different times during the day. One at sunset, one during each of the stages of twilight, and one after dark. Come on with me. Let's learn. The first thing we're going to talk about is how I plan a shoot like this. The second thing is we're going to talk about our goals because our goals tie into other things, right? The third thing we're going to talk about is actually making the photographs. And the fourth is a little bit of information about how to process this image. That can get really deep, so we'll just show you the basics on that. How do I plan for a panoramic image? Well, there's a number of ways that I get ready to take a picture. And some of them I can do from home, and some I cannot. The things I can do from home include using apps and some software. The apps that I use most commonly are Weather Underground, and photo pills. Weather underground, obviously, to find out what the sky is doing. Is it going to be raining? Is there going to be some clouds, no clouds, all clouds? All those things are really important to me, plus the temperature. So even within weather underground, there's some information about the sun and the moon, so you can have just like a quick look. When's it going up and when's it coming down? I find weather underground to be very reliable. When I used it to plan this shoot, I realized that I only had I think one clear night out of the next 10 days. So I absolutely had to do it on one day, according to Weather Underground. So I planned everything around that. So the next thing I did was I chose a location. I've scouted around where I live for a while. So I have some favorite places to shoot. One of these is a bridge that's within walking distance of my house. Uh, so I can sit up there, I can shoot many, many times. I can get there quickly. If the light's changing, I can just, boo, I can be there in a moment. So I use Google Maps sometimes, but one of my favorite tools that gives me the most ability to do things is PhotoPills. PhotoPills allows me to make a plan and I drop a pin and I can see within PhotoPills, where is the moon gonna come up? Where is it not going to be? Where's the stars? Where's the Milky Way? There's so many things you can learn there. For this photograph, all I really needed to know was their moon or not. And if there was, was it going to affect my exposure or the shadows or the things that I would want to know when planning ahead? There's some things you just can't do on an app. I have scouted in person a number of times. Uh, I'd go down there and I'd take pictures. In fact, here's some footage from the first time I went to go and take one of these shoots. And it was just a scouting mission, so it wasn't critical that I make the pictures well. I was experimenting with which things would help me achieve my goals. My goal is to shoot one panoramic that I have to stitch, which is multiple images, but shoot it at different times of the day. So I have to go back to exactly the same starting point and go across so that I have the best chance of laying these images on top of each other and being able to register them properly. So I want to set up my tripod and not move it, not even a millimeter, and take a picture wait 20 minutes, take another picture, wait 20 minutes, take another picture, over the course of two hours. Back to the scouting. So I found the place that I thought I want to be, tried to make sure that there's no trees or anything in front of my lens, and then I zoomed in as tight as I could. I'm like, let's give myself the best chance of doing this. And I thought it was a great idea, but at maximum zoom on my 70 to 200 lens, I filled the frame and that turned out to be a mistake because any, any mistakes that I made were amplified by that. Uh, but we'll get back to that. So I shot it, I brought it home and I processed it and I learned from it. That's the most important thing about scouting. You know what the ground conditions are. You know what the safety is like if there's people around. You can learn things you can't learn through a phone or an iPad or a touch device, right? The other things that you can do is you can use the assisted reality, the AR function of photo pills to hold your phone up and sort of look around and see, oh, this is where the moon's going to come up or this is where the Milky Way is going to be. Things like that you want to know. Or where's the sun setting, which is something I needed to know. It was going to be off my left shoulder. So that way I knew that it was illuminating my foreground, which is, you know, a good idea for a sunset. So I did all that planning. I did a test shoot and I brought certain gear along for that. And the things I learned from that was that I think I can bring less gear next time, which I really, I'm glad that I did that test shoot because I could just, I could operate in a more efficient manner the next time I showed up. 
So let's take a moment to talk about kitting out for this. I'm gonna walk over to the bench and we can see what kind of stuff I'm working with. This is the kit that I'm working with presently. This is a TrioPod 75 carbon fiber legs. We have the Magic Ball. This is fantastic, the MB, Magic Ball. Classic, right? And then we have the Q Pro 2, which is a really heavy duty panoramic base, solid. I love it because it has so many different gradations of pano on it. And I used the 72 when I was uh, zoomed out. And we're gonna talk about how, many, how, many, how much do you wanna overlap, right? And it has a bubble level. This has a flat plate on it, but you can remove the flat plate and replace it with the Magic Balance. This is the MBAL Pro 75, and it fits right in there in place of the flat plate. I also have some longer lens plates to use when trying to find the nodal point. Um, and then I have various quick release accessories here so that I can uh, set up the way I want to. So the beauty of the TrioPod is, unlike most tripods, you can just build your tripod like this. So we have the tripod built. And I'm gonna spread the legs out a little bit more so we have a more even base here. When I first went out, I started with a magic ball. And you'll notice that without a bushing, this has a 3 8 and a 3 8 So that's a good match, right? And you can mount your, your camera directly on top of this. You can. It's a quarter 20 screw, or if you unscrew this, which you should use the supplied multi-tool, all you have to do is insert that in there. And then I'll show you this. This is a 3 8 and a quarter 20 on the other side, and you can flip it over. And now that's a 3 8 which is really, really handy to not have to worry about bushings in the field. Uh, so what I needed to do was I needed to mount the Q-Pro 2 on top of that. And voila. So now I have a very strong Magic Ball ball head and the Q-Pro 2, and I'm ready to go. So this was kit number one. This is how I, I handled it. Um, and it was really great. And when I went out there, it was good to be able to just level this off because the bubble levels up top and good to go. But what I realized was this is not just a tripod, it's a tripod system. So I said, what if I just mounted this to that? I don't need, I'm on level ground. I don't really need all of this flexibility if I know I'm just going out. To take a pano. So here's what I did. I took this plate and I unscrewed it. Popped it out. And I took the magic balance, which is right here. And I take uh, the largest hole, which is over here, the white dot and the white dot. Align those. And then grab the arm, make sure you take the, the collar off of it, and then you screw this in, and this is the lockdown for the, the bowl. Now this bowl, I'm gonna turn it sideways for you, this bowl is a leveling head. So now that we've inserted this in here, we have to lock it down with the three set screws, and voila. So. This also has the reversing quarter 20 and 3 eighths. It's already on 3 eighths right now. So we're gonna match that up with this guy. And now there's the difference. Instead of having that beautiful magic ball on top, which is a wonderful tripod head, all I need to do is set up, level this, 
and then get to making panos. So that was my thought for the second one was just to do this. Let's head back over there. So kidding out was, was a lot of fun because I knew that when I was getting ready to walk out the door, I could just build the support system, the tripod that I needed to fit my needs for the night. I wasn't locked into always having a ball head. I could just bring some sticks that had a leveling base and the pano on it and be good for the night. Um, so to me, that felt really good. And when it came time to do the final shoot, it worked out really well because it was frigid that night. So let's talk about the shoot. I arrived right before sunset and I set up the camera and I chose uh, go from all the way to the left, all the way to the right of the bridge to give myself extra room to capture this panoramic. Also, I guess you're what I would call a conservative when it comes to pano stitching. A lot of people say that you can leave just one third overlap. Let's say this is the entire image, just overlap one third of it. I prefer to overlap 50%. So what I do is I look on the back of the camera through the EVF and I choose an object that's on the right side of the frame and then I turn the camera until that ends up a third of the way on the left. So I repeat that over and over and that was before I had a panoramic head that had the, uh, the detents. But that habit I brought over with me to having advanced equipment like this and I still like to give the software as much chance as possible. And I think of it like this. The pixels are free, the storage space is free. You already bought it. So why take the chance of going to this place and setting up and not overlapping enough and failing at your pano? That's my rule. It works out 99% of the time. So I think it, it's good for me. Moving on. So I, what I did was I did a visual inspection through the lens and I started with the lowest number. And of course that was not enough because I was at 70 millimeters this time. And then I, I kept increasing uh, the number of gradations on the panoramic head until I found something that satisfied my need for overlap, which is about 50%. And that ended up being the 72. So I set it to 72. I turned my camera to vertical and I would noted the marking down at the bottom. And I said, this is where I'm going to start every single time. So that was my home base. When I was done with every pano, I would move it back to that and run over to the car and sit in there and go on my hands because it was so cold. Um, and then I'd wait it out for the next stage of the light that I wanted to capture. So I took a picture during sunset. In fact, a couple of them during sunset into blue hour. Uh, one definitely a blue hour. And how did I know these things? Within photo pills up at the top, they give you the exact time ranges for where you are. Very helpful if you want to stay as warm as possible. What I did was I planned out to hit basically the middle of each of those uh, in all of the stages of twilight because each of those stages has different qualities of light and you won't know them unless you shoot them. So how much light is reflecting off of the atmosphere and creating a soft glow on the landscape versus when do the shadow details really start to die down? When do the brightest highlights in your scene balance with all of the other elements in the scene? When do they become too bright versus the scene? Meaning, in this case, there's lights all over the bridge and they are much brighter than the bridge itself. So I ended up having enough photographs with enough information from this that I could go home and warm up. And then I could process all of these panos separately. And uh, then I could layer them on top of each other and pick the parts that really made the story that I wanted to tell. Let's talk about the panos. I'm gonna pull up the panos in Lightroom. So here's my Lightroom. This is after I've imported everything. Um, and you'll notice that I, I have rejected some of these images because I realized that I really didn't need to go that far with some of these. And here is one whole row. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I have eleven images per stitch. And we'll take a look at what this means. So you can see how much overlap I have here. 
it's just because I'm a conservative pano photographer. Um, so I have this first group here and we will make these a little bit larger so you can see them. There's the first group and that is definitely reflected sunlight in the atmosphere, no direct sun. Uh, that's when I really plan to get there because the sky started to turn, turn these beautiful colors. That's a classic sort of sunsetty thing, correct? And then I shot a couple of variants of that just to make sure that I got it because, you know, these things change rather quickly. Uh, so you might like one of these sets of colors better than another. And sunsets are notorious for being uh, uh, rapidly changing. So I shot a bunch of those and then we got to one of my favorite times to shoot, which is when it gets into blue hour here. So you can see that there is still reflected light bouncing off of the clouds behind me and illuminating the bridge here. Yet the sky has this beautiful blue to it. And we're, we're looking at this all the way across. Yeah. And there's a little bit of reflected light on the windows over here. And all of that looks really nice. Um, and this, I, I knew when I started processing that that would probably be the base of the image because it's very pleasing to see all of that balanced lighting. This first group is taken during civil twilight. And that's when the sun is from sunset down to negative six degrees. And you see it's characteristic of having a very bright sky. Um, and I'm looking to all the east, northeast here. Um, and that's where the light goes. It comes up from the west and it bounces on the sky and the clouds and it comes down into this area. And the prettier colors are usually uh, the duskier, rosier, pastelier ones are opposite where the sun sets. The next group after that is nautical twilight and the sky gets much darker and that's down here so you can see these images the sky is getting much darker here um, if you needed to see clearly outdoors um, artificial light would be needed so blue hour is the end is, is at the end tr traditionally at the end of civil twilight uh, and that's when you get, it's a really narrow window of this beautifulness. And then the next step after blue hour is leading into nautical twilight. And that's when the sun is from six to 12 degrees below the horizon. And that's when you need artificial light to see. And the brightest of stars start to come out during this time. And you'll be able to see probably a star. There we go. There's stars here. So these stars are coming out so during this time during nautical twilight you can start to see the brightest of stars um, so during this time there's a little bit more balance you can see some shadow detail on the bridge and you can definitely see some of these man-made light sources so there's some interesting opportunities there and i shot a couple of different variations there one where the lighting was much darker so i could keep the highlights and also one where the, everything else is a little bit brighter uh, so that we got some of this information here. And then finally, uh, you have astronomical twilight. The sky is very dark, but it's brighter in a westerly direction. Here I'm facing east. So you'll note that it's a little bit, a little bit better than it could be. Um, I'm at ISO 3200, three seconds at F3.5. Um, so I'm facing north here and it would just be um, not as bright as if I had turned around to my left and shot towards the west. The final group of images were taken during pure night and these uh, have a very dark sky. And let's see if I, I made any adjustments. No, I shot again for the highlights on one group of images and then I shot for more mid-tones as another group of images. So as we're looking at all of these, the long story short, I shot a variety of different times of the evening into night so that I'd have many opportunities. Now let's take a look at what those resulting panos were like. In Lightroom, all you need to do is to select the images that you have, click Photo Merge, 
and then click Panorama. In this case, I shot all of my images vertically, so I'm going to leave it as spherical. Cylindrical is often better for horizontal images, but you can play with the differences in between them uh, and seeing what the, they do. But whatever you do, you want to make sure that you choose the same thing every time you process this. So if you're going to layer more than one of these, you can do that. I like to leave off the auto crop also uh, so that I have a better chance of stacking these up also because you're going to crop in anyway at the end of the day. And then you click merge and this ends up being a task in what you do and these panos end up uh, being part of your catalog. And then you can open them again. But for now, let's bring in Photoshop. I'm going to show you guys the exports that I have here. So let's open up my PSD. This is my final composition. It's got lots of layers. And I'm going to turn off a bunch of layers to get down to the bottom to show you what it was like. The first layer I chose was the magic blue hour shot. Uh, I love this one. It looks great. Um, it's a good one to build on. The second one I chose for the water and not the pixels. And the third one I chose for the sky. And the fourth one I chose for the lights. And the fifth one, I was just adding in some vibrance. And then the sixth one, I added a little bit of a brightness adjustment layer there. Uh, so you can see that my brightness was jacked up a little bit. And then my vibrance was jacked up a little bit. But going back down to the bottom, the first layer that I added was to have that, that water show up a little bit better in the bottom. Uh, and I used a layer mask to mask off uh, the top part, so I'm only bringing in the bottom. And you can see the mask here. And I dropped the opacity down also. The next layer up, I chose for the sky. And I did a layer mask in the opposite direction. I masked out the bottom of the frame instead of the top. So that brought in the beautiful dusky sky. And there's what it looks like within without those other layers. And I'm mixing and matching here to taste. You might do differently. And then the last layer that I added on was just the lights. And that's a lighten blend mode. Uh, so I didn't have to do anything to that layer except for changing the blend mode to lighten. And then I finally added in the vibrance and the brightness adjustments so it pops. And I'm really happy with this. As a wrap up. Uh, I hope that I hope this helped you understand how I approach making a fairly complicated task of taking multiple panoramas and laying them over top of each other uh, to create a blended image. Uh, it would be impossible to create this image otherwise. Um, this is a, a gentle overview on how to look at these things. And what I'd like you to do is, uh, if you want to know more about this, we're going to hold a webinar uh, next week. The link is below in the description. Come join us and we'll take a deeper dive into any of the segments that we're talking about here, which was planning, gearing up, shooting and editing. So we can spend some time going even deeper into those things. Uh, but I wanted to, to share with you guys uh, how I approach solving this visual problem. Thanks so much for coming along. I appreciate you. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you on the webinar.